Hello and welcome to Insights. My name is Namdi Odipo. On this episode, we focus on ongoing reforms into the unified tertiary matriculation examination gains being made and existing challenges as well. And on the other side, in our interview segment, we will be speaking with the Executive Secretary of the Federal Capital Development Authority and we would also be looking at the changing face of Abuja and also look at the challenges being posed by population growth in the model city. Of course, as usual, Elizabeth Omori is here with me. She will be taking on the media review segment. Elizabeth? All right, today on the media review segment, we shall be taking a look at education deprivation in some parts of the country, uh, which is often driven by economic barriers and social cultural norms. Now, these factors discourage attendance and formal education, and most times girls are affected. So how do we address this issue? What has been the role of the media so far in reducing the number of out-of-school children in Nigeria? These are some of the great areas we'll be taking a look at on the media review segment of the program. Bumper packed um, episode, I dare say. Well, let's proceed with the discussion segment. begin the discourse with the impact on ongoing reforms in the unified tertiary matriculation examination. Um, Emmanuel Yahweh is a member of the editorial board of the People's Daily Newspaper. He's also an inspector for UT, UTME. Uh, welcome to Insight. Yeah. Uh, take us through the changing phase of um, entrance examinations into tertiary institutions in the country. There was JAM. Okay, which of course was the board, then there was UME, mm -hmm. and now we have the UTME. Mm -hmm. I mean, what were, what were the deficiencies that, that trailed previous exercises in terms of examination into tertiary institutions, and how has the current UTME changed all of that? Well, uh, when they started JAMB sometime in uh, 1978, you had very few universities in Nigeria. First, you had the first few, four or so universities. You know, and then the others came up. These universities were conducting their own exams directly. JAMP only came in in 1978 because of the complications that we, we, the Nigerian university system was facing. And where, when JAMP came in, it also came with its, a lot of problems. The number of universities spiraled from the first four original universities. Now I don't even know how many universities we have. There are over 100 or over 200. So this came with problems. Problems of standards, problems of uh, building a United Nations, uh, problems, so many problems. So JAM tried to stabilize it. But as JAM was trying to stabilize it, there were so many saboteurs. Some of them, unfortunately, inside JAM itself. They created a lot of problems for JAM. Uh, like you had in this case of uh, the people who were selling scratch cards. Uh, the, the, the system of scratch cards was flooded with so much uh, fraud. Uh, some never returned the money, mm. some sold fake cards and all that uh, kind of a thing. Uh, well, the current registrar, when he came in, in 2016, introduced new reforms. And I started, I came under these new reforms. We are called high opinion leaders. We are not exactly staff of JAM. We are just citizens in society, some former ministers, some former leaders of JAM, some former registrars, some former uh, university vice chancellors. We are in that group, people who have distinguished themselves in their careers in various fields. We come under that group. And we share ideas with JAM, staffers, jump high-level staffers, beginning from the registrar down. 
and a lot of discoveries have been made. We also have in that group scientists, people who are involved in running platforms, who are involved in the communication business. They have been helping us to detect areas of fraud and in examination, in the, in the examination exercise and in the management of the whole examination itself. Uh, when you say a lot of discoveries like you, you just mentioned, is the computer-based test one of the discoveries by, by your group? Yes, it is one of the recommendations. And if you go around, you, you just mentioned that uh, there are a few, I think in our comments, is because of the high standards that are expected, because we want jam to be fraud free. You see, the, the, the society cannot develop mm. when the citizens of the country are not given sound education. So when you create a faulty system where people, through fraudulent means, go into the university and come out as university graduates, but with nothing in the head. So examinations into universities and other higher institutions of learning have to be fraud free. We, we, we've gone on our own to some centers and we've seen some candidates uh, not being able to effectively utilize the computers to, to, to sit for this examination. Isn't that a challenge on its own? At what point do we prep these candidates to be ready for computer-based tests? No, it's done. Uh, JAM has developed systems and introduced them in secondary schools. Okay. And then uh, made sure that this system, you don't even have to be computer literate. You just have to be literate to know how they will, t they will instruct you on how to operate it. It's that easy now? Very easy, very easy. I'm not a technical person, so I won't be able to demonstrate it for you. But at our meetings, this has been demonstrated, and they are very easy to operate. Once you know how to press one, two, three, and A, B, C, and all that, you, you can, can operate them. Maneuver. And then JAM has a mock. Before they write the real exam, okay. they go for a mock test, which prepares them for the real exams. So those who are deficient, will benefit from the exercise. I'll, I'll take that. Uh, I'll, from I'll, the mock test exercise. Great, I'll take that. Yeah. And yet, the, 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 uh, there are other challenges as well. Okay. Uh, let's take power supply as one. Mm -hmm. There have been mm -hmm. cases where candidates are in the examination halls and then they are writing, and suddenly power supply goes. I mean, epileptic power supply is the national challenge as it, as it is right now for Nigeria. Uh, and then it becomes even more difficult for this candidate seeking admission into tertiary institutions. How can we address that challenge, epileptic power supply for, or power supply now for examination centers? Uh, what would be your recommendation from, from your point of view now? I agree with you completely. Well, the part of Abuja where I stay, for the past two days we have not had power. So I agree with you that power is a major problem. Uh, is a major hindrance to national development. It affects JAM operations too. What JAM has done, you have computer-based uh, test centers. These computer-based test centers are all supposed to have generators. Okay. Uh, and they are not the uh, I pass my neighbor kind of generators. They are very strong generators. So immediately NEPA takes uh, their power. That one comes on automatically. And there are areas where they are taking these exams where even there is no NEPA mm. in the rural areas. Exactly. So JAM insists that if you your computer, the, because the computer based uh, test centers are privately run, they are, they are not property of JAM. JAM goes into partnership with private people to run these centers. So before you qualify to be approved as a, an examination center, one of the conditions is that you must have a very reliable generator. So that is being taken care uh, of. Talking about qualification now to be an examination center, please take us through 
the requirements for, for if I have a computer center, <laughs> for instance, now, I mean, if it's something you know, I mean, to please just take us straight with something. Uh, no, you know. it's not it's something. It's not I an can... area your family uh, with. We'll, not, we'll take that up. I'm with, not. I'm with, not. Uh, we'll take that up with the board. With, with the board. Subsequent. Uh, um, there are technical requirements. Okay, great. Uh, which require you know more detailed uh, knowledge than what I have, and in fact, the stage where I come in is when they have finished all this and they are about writing the exams. That's when we go in to. To, to supervise, to make every, uh, sure that everything is smooth. But before then, we come up with ideas, and everybody comes up with ideas in relation to his field. Bankers are also there to try to minimize the fraud that goes on with selling of, 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 of jam documents. And you remember a girl who complained that uh, the money she sold the scratch cards was eaten by a snake. <laughs> you know, so many funny, funny stories were coming out of jam. Uh, bankers are also there. So everybody comes with his knowledge. Former ministers of education, they are all, all there. They, so everybody comes with knowledge from his field of experience. So that is a, an area that is outside my experience. Uh, there, there was a development quite recently where the board expressed um, concern over examination centers, some perceived to established, in fact, as a matter of fact, to be engaged in fraudulent activities. Uh, what, what are your recommendations, or what are the recommendations from your group in tackling that situation? You know, the problem with Nigeria is that when you bring out a system, you want to solve a problem. So some people will study that system very well. Uh, look for ways to circumvent. Uh -huh. that, that is it. As JAM is trying to make sure we have credible exams, there are some people, some of them very intelligent, but they misdirect their intelligence. They try to circumvent it. But thank God we have the kind of registrar we have. He's always thinking ahead. The kind of science he has introduced in JAM is such that he has access to almost every center through scientific means. All the reports get to his office. Sometimes when people are trying to commit fraud, they are in the process of committing fraud, and he's getting the information right there. Sometimes he'll get Perhaps it. using ICT, I guess. Yes. Okay. I, I, I tell you the high-powered opinion. And he gets real-time He gets you know, it sometimes if it's not, scientists. sometimes he goes there himself to catch a culprit, red-handed. Are you optimistic that we are making a headway in we spite are of certain, all of the Certainly challenges. making a yes. headway. I wish there were more Nigerians like the Registrar of Jam. Your group, what are the recommendations that you focusing on in, in terms of reforms now to see to see more successes being achieved in entrance examination into tertiary institutions in Nigeria? Our, our recommendations cover almost everything. Can you take us? Can you can you just give us a sneak peek <laughs> into some of them, even if it's one or two? Uh, no, you see. Parents, sometimes parents, almost want to go and enter the exam hall. We have succeeded in stopping that. They don't have to go there. These are people going to university. Why should a parent want to go and enter the exam hall? They have to stop very far away. We we'll make sure that they stop very far away. And then this pin, mm. the use of this pin instead of the scratch cards, you know, has helped a lot in stopping some of the fraud that was going on. And then the question of transparency. The transparency that has been brought into the activities of, of JAM. You know, JAM was established for many years. It never returned any COBO to the government. But this man, he has come, he has introduced transparency to the extent that he returns on a yearly basis huge amounts of money to the government. Last year, the government felt the money it was returning was even too much. So they said, go and execute some capital projects uh, in well, Germany. When we started our conversation, mm -hmm. you, you made reference to the number of universities way back uh, as at 1978. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you talked about the changes that we've seen so far in terms of the number 
of universities and tertiary institutions in the country. Uh, let's. Um, this, this is on the final note. Now uh, we, we do have a, a large, massive population of college-aged um, um, students out there. Uh, you know, that is the college age population is on the increase yeah. in Nigeria. In terms of access to tertiary institutions, are we getting it right, creating access? Mm, well, I think we are getting it right. There's been a lot of problems along the way. But when you consider the changes that have been introduced and the challenges, I think eventually we'll get it right if we keep on track to these changes. This is where we'll end our conversation on this issue for now. Thank you very much for coming. We hope to bring you back on, um, on other issues regarding um, tertiary education and education in general in Nigeria. We have been speaking with Emmanuel Yahweh. He's a member of the editorial board of the People's, uh, of the People's Daily Newspaper and is also an inspector for UTME. Thank you so much, sir, for coming on Insight. You're welcome. Well, we'll now go on to the interview segment where we will be discussing the FCT, that is the Federal Capital Territory Abuja, and the impact of population growth on, um, on infrastructural development in the city. Moving ahead now, we will take a look at development issues in Nigeria's capital city, Abuja, and how the model city contends with infrastructural challenges in the face of population growth. I have joining me in the studio the Executive Secretary, the Federal Capital Development Authority, Engineer Umar Gambo Jibre. Welcome to Insight. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So very quickly and as um, concise as um, possible, uh, please help us put this into perspective. Uh, there, there is the Federal Capital Territory Administration, and there's also your agency, which is the Federal Capital Development Authority. Uh, where exactly or what exactly are, are their roles and where, what are their mandates? And because I, I do know that a lot of people uh, not just in Abuja, but across the country, take them as, as one and same entity. Well, thank you very much. I think, uh, let me start on the very simple one, even though that, I hope it will not compound my issues. When you say Federal Capital Development Authority, you are talking of FCDA. And then you say Federal Capital Territory Administration. So that is FCTA. FCTA. Now, FCDA is a development agency of the federal government established in, by the Act of FCT of 1976 to essentially develop the infrastructure of the federal capital city and the territory at large in terms of the regional development. So basically, we are an establishment that is supposed to have given life, to give life, so to say, to the Federal Capital Territory in terms of bringing out the master plan in the city and then for regional developments, provide the plan in the design and development of infrastructure, the entire gamut of infrastructure, roads, water supply, electricity, telecommunications, and all the others, sewerage, you know, and name them. All of this is supposed to be done by the Federal Capital Development Authority. And then the interface with all agencies of government in the territory in terms of developing their buildings and other facilities, they are supposed to be oversighted by the Federal Capital Development Authority. Example is, if Ministry of Information is building maybe the, would I say, a complex mm -hmm. for the ministry in Abuja. Overall, even given every organ that is supposed to be within the built environment to produce that, the FCDA is supposed to be the 
overall supervisor like the one that has been done at the national library mm -hmm. is under the federal minister of education but fcda is the supervisor we have to be the one especially that will... for federal projects if correct I you right. federal projects all federal government projects in the federal capital territory we are supposed to be so federal secretariat all this are supposed to be under our purview we are interfacing with the FIRS to do their own complexes. There are quite a number of these, the correctional services uh, uh, agency, the former Nigeria Premium Service, we are looking at what they are doing right now in their new development in the Karshi area. And uh, of course, coming back home, the Nigerian Television Authority mm. complex, which has been on just behind us here. It's, it has been in, uh, with the supervision of the FCDA. Well, so how, how is that different from the now, FCTA? Along the line, mm. the necessity for administrative oversight came up when the, the then administration of uh, Shio Shagari, when they created the Federal Capital Territory Administration. And then we had a minister who looks at the administrative function of the entire territory and then looking at social services, areas of education, health, you know, social welfare, you know, and then the administration matters all of that. I think is within the purview of and with the coming of the order one of uh, two thousand and four when El Fai was the minister. It now again redistributed this to the extent that some of the functions of the FCDA were streamlined, so to say. And then the secretaries were created to look at, in the long run, some activity that FCDA was doing, but we needed to like, allow other agencies, because of the evolution of the FCT, to come on to operate and maintain them. Okay. such as transportation that is what led to some seeding of some of the functions that had to do with operation and maintenance to the level that at that time the core mandate of fcd was streamlined and then we were left with planning design and developing so when we develop we now hand over to agencies such as like i said this transport for them to operate the you know the transportation system in the city and maintain them. In the area of water supply, the water board came on board, mm -hmm. and then the AEPB came on board because of issues of, you know, solid waste management and maintenance in the city. So we develop and when we complete, hand it over to these agencies for them to operate them and maintain so that at least the city will be better for it because of the, you know, expanse of the entire uh, city requirements. Is development and, uh, control under your purview as well? Uh, development control ought to be under FCDA, quite okay, to be frank, because we cannot be having the development with us. Because after all, then, you're, in, you're in charge of land use. Yes, so, but maybe if I give a direct answer, no. They are not, but we have a lot of synergy in making sure that whatever it is that they do, because of course they do it under the legal power of the FCDA. That's why you see anywhere you go, if you see demolition notice and you don't see FCDA there, then there is, it's like a giveaway to whoever is in contention with the administration or the authority. So, but that is, it is under the uh, Metropolitan Management Agency, which is like I said, some of those creations that were meant to, you know, smoothen the operations and, you know, maintenance of whatever the FCDA has developed. Good. And then, so like I said, there is now the administrative head who is the Honorable Minister of the Territory, and by uh, the arrangement, he is the chairman of the board of FCDA. So that is how these clear distinctions are. Great. 
I, I, there's something quite obvious, uh, as in especially recently when you drive around the city centre, especially within the city centre, mm. you see lots of, um, I wouldn't say new projects now, but you, you, development authority mm. uh, seem to be reactivating a certain project. Roads that were either so blocked are now being opened, access way now being opened and mm. all of that. Are these projects merely to give a facelift to the city or the, the manifestation of the master plan for Abuja? Just like I did mention earlier, the role of FCDA is to plan, design and develop this facility. So which means the master plan arrangement is what we are primarily, implementing yes. primarily. And um, when the administration came on board this uh, from 2015 up, up to now, the focus has been that we try to, you know, finish up the ongoing projects. And you know in the past there are so many of them that have been lying, you know, at various levels of accomplishment. Mm. So even when the administration came back in 2019, the focus just keep going on to make sure that we emphasize on finishing this very, very, very important projects that have commenced that would have made life simpler for the citizens of the territory, such as the expressway that we have in the city and then some of the water projects that we have that are still not able to meet the requirements of the city. So in other words, in particular again, the road that you recently saw us talking about, which is the one that is just by our side here, um, the one we call um, S8 and 9, S meaning the southern part of the northern parkway, I mean the parkway arrangement, and then the N is the northern part of that uh, parkway. The parkway arrangement is like going within the spine of any city, mm. you know. And that is the one that we just effected, not a total completion, but at least we are now giving it the final definition of its character, such that when you start from like Mabushi, if you say, from Mabushi interchange coming towards the central area, you now have to move in that directional movement that we have launched last week Friday, which is that you keep the National Mosque, mm -hmm. the Communica Center, FCDA, NTA, let me not jump, NTA mm -hmm. headquarters, FCDA, you keep it on the left and go in that concentric movement, going this way up to Muhammad Buhari way. And then you can also enter it from the Muhammad Buhari way, go on the northern side and move on back again between the Kanulazan office and the Communica Center down to the National Mosque and then up to Eradua Center. That's the real master plan arrangement for movement in these directions. There are interfaces with other adjoining streets as you come on or as you move around. All these ones are trying to comply with the rotational movement as it is enshrined in the master plan. And I think you can see from what mm. has happened from then that there is some sanity. People are now moving in the manner that it simplifies. You can move from the life camp area. Let me use that as an example maybe because that is where the seat of the Orang minister is. If you come from the life camp, you don't need more than seven to ten minutes to get to this area. Agree, which in the past, totally. you can bet it is not likely that you are able to get that. I agree. Yeah. The, the so past, yes. we are doing That's everything right. to make sure that this movement is uh, simplified. There are ample signs that have been put in place. By the time we are done, like I said, with some of the little outstanding issues in terms of finishing the wearing courses, putting on the street lights that should power this, uh, places and some of the additional signs that will require at some of these intersections that cause some bit of confusion. Exactly. I, I think it will come. be I, I think to get <laughs> to a point where nobody will 
tell you, no, don't go this direction. You just know exactly how you can move and where you cannot. Uh, of course, that is going to take some time, Absolutely. Uh, especially for motorists to understand. In the first instance, we're allowing for at least the next one month. Right. But I, see, I, I, see, I see officers of um, the uh, VIO you know, VIO officers road impounding traffic. vehicles. Mm. One, one, would, one would expect or imagine that there would be a period a leeway, you know, for motorists to get used no, I think to these changes. Let's not confuse it with the general issues. No, I'm actually talking about I mean, within this one-way movement. Yes, that's actually uh, what domain. I'm talking about. Yeah. I think what we agreed is okay. for the next one month. One month. People will be guided okay. because, like you can see, without the officers on the critical junctions, I it think it becomes more difficult. Yeah. Can, people are just not ready. These signs are there. At each of these very, very critical locations, we have signs that tells you whether you can move forward straight on or don't go left or don't turn right or this is only one way or this is an outlet only or inlet. All these signs basically are there. Mm. I know there are missing ones, like I said, and we're making efforts to put them on place. The ones on the, on the driveway, because we have not done with the final wearing course, we will do that immediately. The lanes are marked so that you know that as you are going, you are only to be going on one particular direction. But even at that, you can bet that you know some citizens are always, you know, I don't want to say they, they feel as if they don't see what. If you have a driver license yes. tested, I don't expect some of what we see happen in this country. Because if you go for a test, there are things, you must have the entire road uh, traffic booklet as your guide. Spelling out the rules Absolutely. and regulations. But in Nigeria, you see a lot of our citizens, unfortunately, they see the sign that says, don't turn left. It's as if nothing says, go left. I agree totally so that we I need to do we, a lot we more need, we, need this, we need this buffer, if yes. I use that word, so that people will have to begin to change their psyche and make sure that they respect this science, even without any officer standing on the way for them to be guided. Uh, let me take you further and, um, uh, in fact, I ask you this. The, the master plan, you've made reference to it time and time again. Correct, it's correct, critical and correct. central to what you do in the FCDA mm. in terms of development in the FCT. Mm. For many years, in fact, there was this powerful myth mm -hmm. about the Abuja master plan. Mm -hmm. You know, it That's seemed, it wasn't just, it, it, was, it was regarded more or less as a law not even an instrument of law. Mm. I can agree that it's a document for, for, for development. Okay? What legal instrument helps you to drive the implementation of the Abuja Master Plan? Well, the law establishing Abuja is very clear. Okay? This, this Master Plan, the beauty of it is you said it correctly, it's not, it's not a law as such. But it is something that also is not supposed to be static. It's dynamic. So we ought to be looking at it vis-a-vis -vis what goes on, you know, with our own uh, development uh, sequence. So ideally, the master plan is something that is to be reviewed periodically, and it is being reviewed accordingly, even though there are times that, yes, the timeline would mm -hmm. surpass what you are meant to review within a given period, okay? Like it's supposed to have been five years, okay. but of course, I know five years sometimes goes, right now we are looking at the review process okay. within this year, maximally, because we've been talking about it way back since 2018 and 19. So we look at it and ensure that whatever is enshrined there that is not in conformity with the evolving trend it's taken into fact. The issue of population explosion is one very fundamental thing, and I think that alone has to be looked at vis-a-vis -vis where we are in terms of the implementation of the code. So those are, and then some of the technologies that are evolving, which were never envisaged in the past, you have to bring them into focus in making sure that the master plan is to be for the benefit of people. It's not for anything else. <laughs> And that is what we are really working on very, very hard. 
Well, it's interesting that you, you brought up the issue of population growth in Abuja, and it's a major a problem. I, I do have an idea that uh, upon inception, uh, the city was planned for a population of just a little over 3 million. 3.1 precisely. 3 point, exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. But that's not what we have on ground very right well. now. Very well. And it's, uh, this has translated to decline of, I mean, it, it's what we have described as infrastructural challenges now. Mm -hmm. uh, in, as we contend mm. with population growth. Mm. It, it's seen, it, this has also seen the city divided into, into two segments, if I dare say, mm. an area where, where we have um, a planned city mm -hmm. and another area where we have um, amorphous um, developments and unplanned settlements mm. that have become squatter settlements. Mm. How are you contending with that challenge? Well, again, that is what I said. It's a very tough one. It's a matter of trying to prioritize and see where you can you can you can up your your your, your game, mm. because in the first instance, the fund is not available for you to do all of this, even if the 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 arrangement is for us to like finish phase one okay okay so many years back we have had costs like i said just because of the effect of the issue of population mm. we, are, we are not even done 100 percent with the infrastructure development of phase one alone and we have four phases and we have in fact we have five five phases now hitherto we had phase one we okay. have phase two we have phase three and then Four, four, south and north. Exactly. Now, in the in between of the phases, four, north and south, which used to be like the belly of the city, which is around the Luke Bay to airport axis, that has not been in the in the master plan arrangement. Now it has been turned into the phase five. All right. So we really literally have five phases of the city. I'm saying out of these five phases. We are only able to, maybe in the totality, develop our infrastructure to level of just 40%. That's why I'm saying the phase one is not even fully, yes, of course, almost 90%, but it's not fully done with because we still have some few areas that have not been able to get their either roads linked mm. or one facility or the other not really provided as per the master plan arrangement. And we, by now, ought to have gone beyond phase even three. But again, you can be sure that, like I said, the entire place has become so complex that you have to find a way to at least attempt to assuage the arrangement so that there is continuity. Okay. That's why the issue of finishing ongoing Critical infrastructure is very important, and I think that's where you really have to give credit to the current administration. If you come from the AYA in the past, you cannot literally move into the city as you want. But right now, from middle of last year, 2018-2019, you could see that a lot has happened, and we open up the inner southern expressway which you call the good luck a belly jonathan that has removed that barrier in the same manner the airport expressway in the past it was you know when the administration came it was like you keep moving and meandering between obstructions to one completed zone or the other that has been removed and we now have a very very smooth movement except again for this on you know <laughs> the, the the way we do our things you yes. see people moving in every direction as if there is no sense of you know patriotism in us i, I would join 
many out there who, who agree that yes, indeed, a lot has been done in terms of road construction and opening up assets, assets with, mm -hmm. within the city center. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, I, I would like to ask you this, in terms of other areas like uh, management of waste, mm -hmm. for instance, um, water supply, Correct. not just within Abuja now, know, but know, in satellite know, towns know, like Kubwa, like Lugwe that you mentioned, Correct. like Correct. Ogolada. Correct. Correct. Uh, what are you doing to redress the existing uh, poor supply and poor management of waste in these areas, for, for instance? What I know is, like I said, everything derives from the master plan arrangement. The solid waste management system of the city has long been planned and, you know, agreed upon. So as in your opinion, is that working? I'm not, I didn't say so yet. <laughs> it is working in the sense that, yes, we have gotten, to, I think the solid waste development component is the one that has suffered the most. Mm. Every other thing, water... Uh, road networks, electricity, to a large extent, they have surpassed the critical issues that, to our mind, would disturb the administration. But the solid waste is the one that has suffered the neglect for too long. And I think well, it is already yes. been addressed. Okay, great, fantastic. Yes. Well, well, fast losing time, so no. time, time. Mm. and you've talked about assuaging the situation. Yes, we're having the law mm. in mm. The implementation of certain phase. We've, mm. we've got the target five phases to complete. Mm. We are yet to fully implement, completely if, if implement I phase may one. Say, in terms of the water supply, yes, please. There is already an, a, a contract that is coming on stream using the Chinese uh, Exim Bank loan that will give us over 30 districts that align within the phase two and three that will be serviced effectively. We don't have issue of raw water supply and, and treated water also up to where we have our reservoirs. But uh, very the distribution area is where the critical is and that is being addressed by this project. Uh, well, great. Uh, very quickly, uh, words of assurance to residents of the FCT in, in terms of infrastructure being, uh, in terms of the weight and, um, uh, you know, the pressure on infrastructure mm -hmm. right now for residents in the FCT. Is there hope in the near future? Absolutely. We are looking at how to open up and get every of the infrastructure to be completed within a very short time. We are no more relying on the, like I said, the budgetary issue is an issue, but we're looking at the public-private partnership window so that we will be able to accomplish this in a very, very fast manner. The solid waste component is one area that is looking at this public-private partnership because that's the best way to go about it. And on, I think on, this, on, on this note, on this very optimistic note, we will end um, our discussion. Thank you so much for coming on Insight. We have been speaking with the Executive Secretary, Federal Capital Development Authority, Engineer Umar Gambo Jibri. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much. Up next is the media review segment with Elizabeth Omorui. Nigeria's education system encompasses three sectors, basic, secondary, and tertiary. Well, education is said to be the bedrock of any society. But what are the implications when a section of the society does not have access to education? My guest, Chinedu Asodo, staff writer of the cable online newspapers, will provide answers. It's nice to have you in our studio. Thanks for having me. All right, generally, let's talk about education in Nigeria. How would you assess this sector? Um, um, once again, thanks for having me on your program. Uh, I would say um, to assess the education sector in Nigeria over the past few years, um, I would say we've been making some progress, but we're still far from getting where you're supposed to be. Okay. We're making some progress in the sense of um, there's been some initiatives that are targeted to getting children back to school, looking at how some children have been displaced from their schools over the years, insurgency and uh, economic barriers, especially in the northern part of the country. So, but despite that challenge, you've seen some initiatives, government partnering with some development organizations like UNICEF and some other development partners to ensure that these children get back to school. That's for the basic education. Same with the secondary education, we've seen JAM introducing some measures, you know, apart from yielding revenue, getting more funds for them. 
they also ensuring to see that there is transparency in the sector and also for tertiary institutions you know and other higher levels we've seen um lots of progress in that regard ensuring that the system is cleaned up so we're not just talking about progress in terms of getting children back to school. We're talking about the quality of education now, ensuring that the process of teaching, the quality of education being taught these people are also in order. And we've seen the increase in enrollment, um, looking at the government's efforts in, in the area of um, the, uh, the school feeding programs mm -hmm. and some other incentives provided for teachers, especially in the northern, in the northern part of the country and in rural communities. So some of these incentives, you know, allow acts as a moral booster for them to get to school. But like I said, we're still far from where you're supposed to be. Okay. Now, let's talk about factors hindering some in some parts of the country. There's economic barrier, yeah. so, uh, cultural barriers. So how can we address these issues? Okay. Because I understand that we have about 10.2 million children out of school. This figure is quite huge. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about... Um, factors that usually are hindering students, children from getting to school. Most of our attention goes to the federal government. We feel that they're failing in their parts. But I think it's high time we started looking at what the state governments are doing to ensure that the children in their states get to school. Okay. I think one of the major failings of the state governments is um, lack of political will. So you see a situation where some states, you know, for instance, sometime in 2018, you beg said that about 7 billion naira was not you know, assessed by about 24 states. So, and the counterpart funding is there. These states just need to provide a little percent of the, of the, of the money so that they be able to assess these funds. But most of them are just, you know, not even interested in that money. So, and you ask yourself, what is the problem? Why are they not assessing these, the funds? And some of the states are not even aware that these funds, funds exist. Are available. So, the UBEC comes and, you know, keep on hammering that you should come and assess these funds. Just contribute that little quota. But you see them injecting funds in some frivolous projects like buying cars and all that. So, first of all, you have to do it political way at the state level. A good number of the state governments are not even bothered about education. You go to most rural communities and you see the dilapidated infrastructure that the students are going to school and be wondering how can a child learn in this kind of environment. So when you look at political way, then you talk about, you know, making sure that you implement the policies that are already existing. For instance, the UBEC Act provides for free and compulsory education, but how many states are, are, is that, you know, being affected in? Understand. So most often we have policies, we have laws that we are sure to get children back to school. But in most cases, nobody wants to implement them. And we see just last week the House of Reps dedicated a full plenary session to, to just debates on out of school children. Yes. And it's just the same phrases and speeches that are rehearsed over time. Understand. So we have to look beyond words. We have to look beyond, you know, just talking and start acting. We have to make sure that we implement the existing laws. You know, most of the states we tell you that they have free education policy going on in their states. But we see the rural communities and you see lots of children in the streets. I'm wondering why are these children not in school? You know, I was in Sokoto recently and I was in the state secretariat, the Ministry of Education, some of the key ministries that you see children, you know, hawking things around those ministries during school hours. And then you see the Commission of Education. You say there is free education in your states. And see children, Around you know, him. washing cars, you know, roaming the streets. And we're wondering, what's the problem? And they will tell you, yeah, you cannot force the parents. But you have to show the way. You have that, to. that brings me to my next question. Yeah. You know, out of the 10.2 million out-of-school children, girls have the highest percentage. Why is yeah. this so? So most often, the parents see their girls as, you know, instead of you to go to school, I would, I would just want you to maybe go for primary prim prim education, maybe just for a few years and then get, you know, hand them over to prospective tutors. So you see most of these girls, they would, they would like to go to school, but their parents are looking at the benefits of maybe handing them to early tutors. So you're looking at, okay, maybe this is going to help your family, give you some money, and they see now if, how can my child go and waste, you know, waste in quotes, waste some years in school when there's a man willing to take her in understand so it's bad and then you see most often you know the women are deprived in those societies so you're not looking at the benefits of her going to school how she's going to help the family in the long run how she's going to be able to stand for herself in the society you know and also be, to be able to speak for her peers you're seeing it as okay she's just a gear 
what she doing in school. Let her stay at home and help her siblings. You know, if her brothers are going to school, what stops her from going to school as well? So most often you see the female gender being subdued and, you know, there's that stigmatization that what she going to school, let her stay at home and help in chores when she's drive for marriage. She take, and you see little girls being handed over in marriage when they're supposed to be in school. When they're supposed to be in school. So yeah. at what point would equality come to play? Now we talk about equality. Yeah. Girls going to school, boys going to school. When when some are deprived, so where does where do we strike the balance? I think we should be able to just tell ourselves the truth. Understand that there is no if a guy if if a boy is being sent to school, nothing deprives the sister you know from going to school. So it's some of those factors that the societies have put in place and say, okay, a guy is not supposed to be in school. She's supposed to help and stay back at home. You know, it's some of those factors that I've seen that, okay, the parents poverty. are not being guided. Yeah. If you're talking about poverty, it also affects the boy in the family. Understand? If a family, if, a, if a, maybe a, a parents have like five children and you see two boys in the school and then three, three of, the, of their siblings, female siblings are at home. If you're talking about poverty, it's also cuts across all the people, all the persons in the school. So why not just you know, give birth to the ones you can be able to take care of. And if you're going to say, okay, fine, I want to have five children, ensure that at least there is some level of education. And the good thing is that there are some development partners that are even bringing in new initiatives to see that parents send their children to school. I was in Zanfara and I saw what UNICEF are doing there. You know, sometimes they provide some cash for parents to see that, okay, have this for your children. Maybe it's 10,000 naira for your term. Even education amounts. You understand? Yeah. So, but you see still some parents seeing, seeing that it's a waste of time. So some of them will just go to school. When they get that money, they will take their children out of school. You see some of the children, when it's like 11, 12, they are being sent out to go and hawk. You know, why is that? So most often you have to deal with, you know, the society. You have to deal with some of the values they've they already use some of their culture. So it's not just about the lack of willingness not being there. Some efforts have been made, but are the parents seeing the need for them to send their children to school? Okay. Now, just recently, mm -hmm. uh, 1 million, 1.9 million um, Nigerian youths undergraduates sat for um, JAM, yeah, yeah. Um, which is the highest so far. Does that mean there's, the, there's a boost in the sector? I really don't think that means there is a boost in the sector. Okay. It's just difference in numbers, you understand? Right. But we should be more concerned about the system. Has it improved over the years? Mm -hmm. Jamb is doing well in terms of um, revenues and all that. But they should, make, you know, they should have it in the, back, in the back of their mind that that's not their common date, you understand? You should be able to improve the system so that at least going forward you see the transparency in the system. So if it's, they remitted, I think, 7 billion naira for the federal government in 2019, that's fine. But what about the system? Has it improved? Is there any improvements, some of the monies they get through revenues, maybe change of correction in your name, you buy new card, all of those things. Some others may see it as exploitation as well. So you have to look at the system holistically. Are there improvements that we are supposed to be? Are there transparency, examination processes, how transparent are they? All those, you know, miracle centers as they call them. How have they, what miracle have they done in centers. the past? Of course. All have done, done in the past to tackle those centers, you understand? So we have to look at the system holistically. They might be doing well in terms of, you know, revenue, the number of persons being enrolled for this examination. Mm -hmm. But how transparent is the system? How effective? You know, can you say that someone that sat for JAM that they can defend their score? Hmm. Yeah. That's a tough one. All right, Chinedu Asodo, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you very much. All right. Let's not forget, education is key. Let's embrace it. Well, that's it for this episode. It's been quite a delightful one for me. Elizabeth, how about you? We're very enlightening. You know, education drives development. Indeed. As such, everyone must have access to it. It's very important. Very true. Join us same time next week for more on Insight. I'm Namdi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. We'll see you next week. <laughs>